Revelation tonight. If you want to get your books out, Bibles out and turn to Revelation chapter 1, we'll start there. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight. I uh, underestimated Eric's wisdom. Uh, he invited me to be first in line, so it can only go up from here. So he, he's very smart in his plan. I'm really glad for the opportunity to lead our thoughts tonight, and I hope the things that we say will be, first of all, in accordance with God's Word, and second of all, will be helpful to you as you strive to live a life that's pleasing to God. Revelation is an important book, and it's, important, it's a book that we often overlook. And maybe it is overlooked because of what we read about in the first verse of the book of Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. At the very start of this book, we find out that this book is not going to be a book like most of the other books in the Bible. This is a book that is highly figurative in its language. A lot of symbolic and figurative language here. And as a result, there are many false doctrines that have their origin in the book of Revelation. It is a playground for the false teacher to take that figurative language and twist it and contort it and make it mean all kinds of things that God never meant for it to mean. There's a lot of figurative language, language that's easy to misapply, and it has been misapplied over and over again in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation has, for the most part, been fulfilled. We are not seeing the things that the book of Revelation talks about being described in the nightly news. We're not reading about the book of Revelation in current events. The things that are written in the book of Revelation have, for the most part, been fulfilled. We're not left to guess what the mark of the beast is. And the mark of the beast is not a barcode or a credit card or a vaccine. We are not waiting for the battle of Armageddon. China and Russia and North Korea are not setting the stage for the battle of Armageddon. That's not what we read about in the book of Revelation. If you've got questions about that, please ask those questions because the book is, is clear on what we're looking at here. And we're not looking at uh, current events when we read the book of Revelation. But... As a result of avoiding the book because of some of this symbolic language or some of the false teachings that are associated with the book of Revelation, we overlook a lot of important lessons that we can get from the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a very comforting book. If it is interpreted like the false teacher wants us to interpret it, the book of Revelation becomes a very disturbing and troubling book. And it leaves people with lots of questions. But God didn't mean the book of Revelation to be a book that caused people to be distressed or have a lot of questions and be an unease. The book was designed to be a comforting book, to remind us that God knows what's going on in the world. There's nothing that's going on in the world that's a surprise to God. And it is a reminder, it was a reminder to the first century Christians, but it is also a reminder to us that God's in control. And God is going to be victorious, and if you're with God, you will be victorious. That's the message of the book of Revelation. And one of the lessons that we get from the book of Revelation, or some of the lessons we get are from the, seven lesson, the letters to the seven churches that you're going to be studying in the Wednesday nights starting now and going forward. And a lot of incredible lessons from the letters to the seven churches. Before we get into those letters, though, we need to look at who wrote the letters. Who is the message coming from that you're going to be studying with me tonight and in the coming weeks? Look at verse 10 of chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Omega, Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head was, and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters." 
He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth where it went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Lots of figurative language still here, isn't there, in these ten verses. And this book is like others that we read about in the Bible where there is figurative language. But I want to tell you, we can understand that figurative language if we'll often just stay in the context. This tells us who's writing the book in figurative language, and it's clear that this is Jesus that's writing, isn't it? Jesus is the author of the book of Revelation, and specifically, he's the author of the letters to the seven churches. John is the penman. And so to the first letter. The first letter is written to the church at Ephesus. That's in chapter 2. But before we look at the letter, let's look at where we're talking about. Ephesus was a capital city, and it was a very prominent city. It was located near the present uh, coast of Turkey. You can see there on your map uh, the area called Asia that we're looking at, where the seven churches were located here in in, in Asia. As we zoom in a little bit on that, you'll see uh, a closer view there. Whoa, whoa, that's a touchy trigger. Now you've seen it all. All right, there's Pergamos. Uh, John, as we mentioned, was riding from the island of Pergamos, and just there on the coast is is, uh, is Ephesus right there. He's riding to the church that was there. Idol worship was very prominent in the city of Ephesus. Idol worship was there. The temple of Diana was there, and there is a representation of what the temple might have looked like. In those days, a very prominent place where worship would be conducted to the false god Diana. It was considered, this temple was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Here's what that temple looks like today. Uh, I think we got a couple columns there from that, from that temple. It's interesting, though, that this temple is mentioned in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 19, beginning of verse 24. In Acts chapter 19, beginning verse 24, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persecuted and turned away many people, saying they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You see, that temple that we just looked at was a prominent fixture in their society. And this man, this Demetrius, was trying to stir up the crowd and get them in a rage that he's going to end up with this great temple being defiled and our great goddess Diana being uh, in disarray. It was very prominent and very important in that city. But there was a church in Ephesus. There were Christians in Ephesus. And the church is mentioned over and over again in our New Testament, this church of Ephesus, not just in Revelation, but throughout the New Testament. In Acts chapter 18, in Acts chapter 18, we learn some important facts about Ephesus. Apollos had been preaching here. And Apollos, you will remember, was mistaken on the the subject of baptism. He was uh, preaching John's baptism in Acts chapter 18, verse 24. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught accurately the things of the Lord, 
though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So Apollos had been preaching in Ephesus, and Aquila and Priscilla, it appears, lived in Ephesus. Two great Christians that we know about in the Bible, Aquila and Priscilla. And they take him aside and teach him more accurately. That had gone on in Ephesus. The church, it appears, in Ephesus was very well established. They had elders in Acts chapter 20, as Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 20, verse 17, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. The church had elders in Ephesus. It was well established and well organized. And due to its prominence, in a, where it stood in Asia being a prominent city, Paul had stayed there for a long time. And he used it, it appears, as a hub to spread the gospel throughout Asia. Notice what it says in Acts chapter 19, verse 9. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from him and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years. Notice this. So that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And so Paul is here in Ephesus, a prominent city, and he's using this sort of like the hub where he can spread the gospel throughout Asia. You might think of, of Ephesus like we would maybe think about New York City. If you want to spread something, you can do a really good job of it in New York City. People are coming and going out of New York City. It's a prominent city. If you want to get a message out, New York City is a great place to do it. Where do you see your nightly news coming from a lot of times? New York City, isn't it? Paul is spreading the gospel from this city of Ephesus. Paul ended up staying there for three years. In Acts chapter 20, verse 31, he's, he tells the elders, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Can you imagine if Paul had been with the church here at South Fayetteville for three years? He'd been there for three years. It was here in Ephesus that the famous book burning occurred in Acts chapter 19, verse 19. In Acts chapter 19, verse 19, also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of, God, of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. The gospel was doing great things in the city of Ephesus. There were these pagans who had been doing these, this magic and this sorcery. When they learned the truth of the gospel, they're so convinced in that, that they bring their books and they say, we're done with this. You have it and burn it. We have no need for it. That's how committed they were in the city of Ephesus. And when it was time for Paul to leave, he didn't leave them empty-handed. He didn't leave them without help. He left Timothy there to work with them. And Timothy stayed and worked with them. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Paul reminds Timothy, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul had Timothy to stay behind so he could keep developing the Christians there. How would you rate the church at Ephesus based on the facts that we've just looked at? You would have to say it was a wonderful church, wouldn't you? They were taking a stand for what was right in a wicked and prominent city. You ever been to a big city with a lot of evil and wickedness? You ever been to New York City? Have you ever seen the wickedness that's in a big city like New York City? And have you ever thought to yourself how hard it would be to be a Christian in New York City? I'm happy that I'm where I am in Tennessee, not New York City, you might have thought. Yet these Christians were taking a stand for what was right in this wicked and prominent city. And you'd have to say these Christians were committed. They had gone all in into Christianity. They got rid of their past life. They burned it. They wanted to be right with God. They were committed. They were a church that was fully organized. It had elders. They had two incredible preachers that had been working with them. And yet within a lifetime, we're going to see a letter that Jesus writes to them where they have drifted away from that. And Jesus is not at all pleased with them. Do you turn over to chapter 2 of the book of Revelation to see this letter that Jesus writes to this church that had been so wonderful that it appeared to have had everything going its way. 
Notice what Jesus says to them in chapter 2 of Revelation, beginning of verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. We know a little bit about that now, don't we? And the things that we've looked at. Jesus knew their works. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have preserved and have patient, persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Jesus writes a rebuking message to the church at Ephesus. They had let some things slip. They needed to change. They had wandered away from Jesus, and Jesus wanted them to come back. They had wandered away in a relatively short amount of time. Within a lifetime, they had gone from what seemed to be a very strong and prosperous church to being a church that Jesus is just about to be done with. They had a lot to change. I want to tell you the church at Ephesus isn't alone. Churches throughout time have wandered away from Jesus. And churches continue to wander away from Jesus. This church might have wandered. This church certainly can wander in the future. And it doesn't matter who has been preaching here. It doesn't matter if there are elders here and who those elders are. It doesn't matter how strong the members are in this church. This church may have wandered. This church can wander. It doesn't matter what this church has done in the past. How many stands this church has taken for the truth? What kind of sacrifices this church has made to stand on the principles of God's Word? It doesn't matter. This church may have wandered. It may be in a condition of wandering now. And it certainly can wander in the future. It doesn't matter what you've done. And it doesn't matter all of the good things you've done. This church is at danger of wandering. And you know what? A church can't wander unless the members wander. And you may be sitting here tonight, and maybe you've wandered. Maybe you're no longer what you need to be. Maybe, sure, in the past, you were very committed. You were burning your books. You were all in. But you may not be there now. And maybe you still are there now, but I'm going to tell you, it's not guaranteed that you won't in the future. Wandering is a danger. It doesn't matter how much of the Bible you know. It doesn't matter how close to God you were or you are now. Wandering is a real danger. And Jesus' message to the church at Ephesus is the same message that he would give you and me today when we wander. And that message is in verse 5. In verse 5, Jesus' message to them and to us is, they Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. There are three things that Jesus would tell us today if we've wandered from Him, and if we're not where we think we need to be in our relationship with God. The first thing He would tell us is to remember. Remember from where you have fallen. When Jesus tells us to remember where we have fallen, I want to tell you that implies that there is an absolute standard. The church at Ephesus had fallen from that expectation, from that standard. And they need to remember what that was. There's an absolute. In other words, the church at Ephesus was right at one time, 
and they're not right now. And they needed to remember where they were because that's where Jesus wants them to be. Remember where you have, from where you have fallen. They were aligned with the expectation. They were aligned with truth at one time, and they're out of alignment now. And they needed to remember. Jesus is telling the church at Ephesus, and he's telling us that there's an absolute standard of right and wrong. There's an absolute expectation that God has for us. It's not something that moves. It's absolute. John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. There's an expectation that God has for each of us. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the life. No one, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's an absolute standard. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding in the religious world today about the standard. There are a lot of people that are religious people that are sitting in a pew somewhere on Sunday morning who would tell you that the standard is just too ambiguous. It's sort of fuzzy. There's really no way to know what God's standard is for you. It's just sort of, uh, it's ambiguous. That's not what Jesus is telling the church at Ephesus, is it? He's, he's not saying, hey, there's some kind of weird uh, standard out here. Maybe you can find it, maybe you won't. No, he says you were there and you're not there. It's absolute. It's not ambiguous. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. Um, uh, Ephesians, let's see here. Did we skip one? No, we did. Ephesians chapter five, uh, 3, verse 2. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to you, to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the, whole, the Spirit to his holy angels and, a prophet, and prophets. Jesus says... And Paul says, there is a standard and you can know it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. God's standard for you is not too complicated for you to understand. It's not fuzzy. It's not ambiguous. It's not something that you would never be able to understand if even if you tried. No, you can understand it. There's a standard that Jesus expects for us, and we can understand it. I want to tell you, when Jesus tells the church at Ephesus, and He's telling us to remember where we've fallen, He also tell, tells us that this is not something that's relative. Have you ever talked to someone about what the Scriptures teach, and maybe you show them in black and white what it teaches and what their response is? Well, that's your truth. That's what it says to you. In other words, it says that to you, but that's not what it says to me. No, it is absolute. It is not a your truth and my truth kind of thing. It's not relative. It is absolute. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Truth is not relative. We all must ex uh, accept the same standard. We must all strive for the same standard. It's not relative. And I want to tell you this standard doesn't move. Ephesus had drifted away from that standard. They were not told, well, you go find the standard wherever it is now. You go, because truth is always move, changing and moving, it's different now than it used to be. You just get back aligned with what truth is today. No, he says, remember from where you've fallen. Truth doesn't move. You hear anybody talk about faith and their religion being a journey? Well, we're on this journey together. And we're just trying to figure out truth as we go, and it's changing. It's changing all the time. Truth is something today, and it's not what it was 100 years ago. And it's certainly not what it was 2,000 years ago. That stuff you read about in the Bible, that's different today. No, it's not a journey. It doesn't change. That standard is fixed. 
And we need to get into that standard. In Jude verse 3, Jude says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Truth is absolute. I'm going to tell you something else that Jesus tells us when he tells us to remember from where we're fallen is that Jesus holds us accountable to that standard. That standard is fixed and absolute. And Jesus holds us accountable to that standard. It matters how we live. And as crazy as it may sound, there are many in the religious world today that tell us it doesn't matter how you live. That once you're saved, you're always saved. That if you just have faith that Jesus is the Son of God, you're saved and it doesn't matter how you live. Don't worry about it. Live any way that you want and it'll be fine. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Is that what Jesus is telling the church at Ephesus? No, He's telling them, remember from where you've fallen. You need to live to this standard. You're not and you need to change. Remember from where you've fallen. Now, God might prefer you live a certain way. He would prefer you not be a liar and a thief and an adulterer. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. He's not all that worked up about it. In fact, it's just the preachers that are all worked up about it. They're the ones that are making your life miserable and giving you a guilty conscience because God doesn't really care one way or the other. That's not what Jesus says. He tells them they need to remember from where they have fallen. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus says it matters how you live. We're accountable. Remember from where you've fallen. But there's something that hurts our memory when it comes to remembering. And that is the rate of change. I envision that Ephesus hadn't gone from where they were to where Jesus is just about done with them overnight. I imagine it was a gradual process. And when things happen gradually, we don't recognize them many times. Does your phone ever pop up a memory for you from a few years ago? Do you ever see a picture of yourself from a couple years ago and say, whoa, I didn't know that I was really aging that fast. I thought things were pretty constant. Boy, I look a lot older today than I did just a couple years ago. It happens gradually, doesn't it? I didn't get all this gray hair overnight, I can guarantee you that. When things happen gradually, we don't notice them. And it can be that way for us spiritually. I'm going to tell you, when we drift away from the truth gradually, many times we won't recognize it. And we've seen it played out in spades in the denominational world, haven't we? The denominational world would not take a firm stand on matters of morality, and they drifted so far away now that they'll accept everything, literally, and think it's okay. That did not happen overnight. And the same people that are sitting in the pew this Sunday listening to the garbage that's being preached and the acceptance that's being preached would have gotten up and left the building in the middle of the sermon 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But it happened gradually, and so they accepted it. Preachers in the denominational world have come out and verbalized that because they did not stand up against marriage, divorce, remarriage as the Bible teaches about it, if they were going to be consistent, they had to accept homosexuality. That was a gradual drift over time. I want to tell you, it can happen here in this church. And all it takes is a little deviation from the truth. Just a little bit. The devil doesn't want you to do it in big steps. He just wants it a little bit. So that you accept it today, you swallow hard and say, well, it's not the way I would like it. If I had my choice, it wouldn't be that way. And it's not in line with what the scriptures teach exactly, but it's just a little bit. We'll just go along with it. Okay, soon 
If you follow that course, if you're consistent, you'll be where everyone else is in the denominational world. Drifting happens gradually. What about in our own lives? Are we accepting things in our own lives today that we wouldn't have accepted in the past? Have we drifted? We need to remember where we've fallen. Jesus says there's an absolute standard, and we're accountable to that standard. How are we living up to that standard? You can't get back to somewhere unless you know where that place is. You can't get back to where you need to be unless you know where that place is. We need to remember where we were, what the Bible says, what the standard is, not where we are today, not what the people around us are doing, not what everyone in the church is doing, not what other churches are doing, but where is the standard? Remember the standard and get back to it. Ephesians needed to figure it out. They needed to use their memory and they needed to remember. And we need to remember as well. Remember from where you have fallen. But I want to tell you, if you look at the church at Ephesus and you look at the letter to them, they were still doing a lot of good things. Notice what Jesus said about their lives. He knew their works. He knew their labor. He knew their patience. He knew they couldn't bear with those who were evil. He knew that they were testing those who said they were apostles and were not and had found them liars. He knew that they were persevering and had patience. He knew that they were laboring for His name's sake and had not become weary. They were working really, really hard. They were still keeping house. They were still doing a lot of good things religiously. But Jesus was not at all pleased with them because they weren't living up to His standard. Just because we're religious doesn't mean we're okay. We've got to be adhering to the standard that Jesus set forth to us. The next thing that Jesus tells them in his letter to them is that they needed to repent. Just realizing that you've drifted away from the standard isn't enough. They needed to repent. And repenting is not just an apology. It's not just a, oh, my bad. Oh, I messed up. It's not, oh, I'm sorry. It's not even, forgive me. Repentance is a lot more than that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9, Paul says, Now I rejoice that you were not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorrow, sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Brethren, when we have drifted, we need to repent. And the response that we need to have is not just, I'm sorry, but it needs to be repentance. Repentance is closely connected with being converted. Notice in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repenting and being converted. Or repenting and changing. Repenting and doing something different are closely related. When Jesus tells them to repent, He's not saying, well, just be sorry that you're not where you need to be. No, He wants them to change. He wants them to do different. He wants them to be better. That's what Jesus wants from us when we've drifted. Repentance means that we're going to leave sin behind with the goal to never return to it again. That's repentance. Not that I'm sorry I did it. Not that I wish I had never done it. But the desire to never do it again, to turn from it and leave it behind. That's repentance. When I was in college, a guy who lived across the hall from me in the dorm came to school as a fairly religious Baptist young man. And from what I could tell of him, he had been a very good boy when he was at home. But when he came to college, he got connected with some people who took him away from what he knew he needed to be doing. 
One night, he came to my dorm room and he sat down in the middle of the room. And he began to regret sorrow for the way that he had lived his life. He regretted it. He told me he hoped I never did what he did to mess up his life the way that he had messed up his life. He was incredibly sorry that he had done it. But he didn't repent. He had no intention to repent. He continued to live the way that he lived. He was as sorry as you could get. And he told me, never do this. But he didn't change. Repentance means we turn from that sin and we never go back to it again. Now sure, we may mess up. But when we repent, our desire is to never, ever do that again. That's what Jesus wants from the church at Ephesus. That's what He wants from us as well. In Colossians chapter 3, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 beginning. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Put them to death. Don't keep them around. Don't go back to them on the weekend. Put them to death. Repentance means we change. It's serious. The way that we live when we drift away from God is serious. It is so serious that Jesus wrote a letter to the church at Ephesus. And in turn is writing a letter to us. Telling us to repent. It's that important. Psalm 51 verse 4. David says, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. You understand, when we sin, when we drift away, when we're not living like we should, we're sinning against God. And that motivation ought to cause us to repent. And finally, in Jesus' letter to the church at Ephesus, He tells them they need to remember where they fall, from where they've fallen. They needed to repent. And they needed to return to Him. They wanted, he wanted them to get back to where they had been. They were right with God. He wants them to be right with God again. When we drift, we were right with God, and God wants us to get back to where we were to begin with. That means we're going to have to obey Him. We're going to have to give our life to Him. Jesus told them to do the first works. Come back to where you've been. Get back to what living the way that you've been living when you were living like you should. This tells me that being right with God is a lot more than me just believing in Him. This is not just a mental exercise. This is just not claiming Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but this is how I live my life. I've got to be obedient to Him. And it's not a complicated formula. It wasn't complicated for them. It's not complicated for us. We just need to be committed to living our lives every day with the same fervor and zeal that we had the first day we were Christians. Jesus tells them to do the first works. Do you remember how you used to be zealous for the Lord? We need to be zealous for the Lord. We've got a young couple in Franklin in the congregation there. And he may be listening to this sometime later. He told me he was going to go back and listen to this. I'm going to tell it. They became Christians about a year and a half ago. And they are so on fire for the Lord. I want to tell everybody that they can about Jesus. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid I'll rub off on Him. I'm afraid that my zeal will rub off on him, and he'll lose that fire. He's on fire for the Lord. Are we on fire for the Lord? Jesus wants us to remember where we came from and get back there. Do the first works again. It's so easy to drift. It's so easy to cool off in our service for the Lord. We need to get back to where we were. Hebrew writer encourages the Christians to do this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. 
But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Paul saying, remember how you were. Keep on living like that. Do the first works. Keep on going. Jesus' letter to the Ephesians is the same letter that he'd write to us when we drift. Remember, therefore, from where you fall and repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from your place unless you repent. Remember, repent, and return. Would you turn with your, me and your Bibles to Luke chapter 15? In Luke chapter 15, we see this exact pattern being played out for us in the story of the prodigal son. Luke 15, verse 11. Luke 15, verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the paws that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? What had he just done? He just remembered where he came from. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you, heaven and before you, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. What did he just do? He repented. And he arose and came to his father. What did he do? He returned. The prodigal son remembered, repented, and returned. And the story doesn't end there. And I will tell you, the story doesn't end for us when we've drifted away and we remember where we came from. We repent of that, we change, and we get back to where we want to be, where God wants us to be. The story goes on. Keep reading with me. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your side and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. When we come back to God, He will welcome us with open arms. He will rejoice with us as we rejoice with Him. And we can be right with Him. When we wander away, brethren, we need to remember, repent, and return. It's vitally important. Jesus was just about done with the church of Ephesus. He might just be done about done with us if we don't return to him. There are going to be consequences. The question for you tonight is, are you living like you should? Are you living to that standard? It's an absolute standard. It's a standard that God demands of all of us. Are you living up to that standard? If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, there's no better time than right now to become one if you know what you need to do. Are you ready to be baptized into Christ? To become one of His children? If you're here and you're not living like you should, maybe you've drifted. Can you make that right? 
If there's anything we can do to help you spiritually, let us know while we stand and sing.